I guarantee you any time a product can be passed off as something more expensive, it will be. Prices are very dynamic. They move up and down every single day. An orange that's grown conventionally and an orange that's grown organically, I think they're going to have the same vitamins in them. Organic food is not healthier or safer for you. Fraud happens more with more expensive foods. Cheaper oil is added to the more expensive oil, and the label still reads 100% extra virgin olive oil. So you think this is olive oil, right? Wrong. Well, maybe some of it is, but this is actually a classic example of food fraud. The extra virgin olive oils are being switched out with cheap ones and fraudulent to sell something labeled as something else. Why is this fish being mislabeled? Your Parmesan cheese products do not contain any Parmesan cheese. As there was no one brand that stood out as completely safe. Wow, so we can't eat anything. I guarantee you any time a product can be passed off as something more expensive, it will be. It's that simple. Counterfeits, dilution, substitution, and mislabeling. Food fraud not only harms consumers' wallets, it puts their health and safety at risk. We might not know the overall impact of food fraud because so much of what fraudsters do is hidden from us and has been for centuries. Some estimates say food fraud affects at least 1% of the global food industry at a cost as high as $40 billion a year, according to the Food and Drug Administration. Grocery manufacturers of America estimated that 10% of the commercially available food in the United States is adulterated. That's one in 10. It means if you're not on that eight item or less checkout line, you've got something in your cart when you leave the supermarket that's probably bogus. Here's how and why fake food sits secretly in our kitchen cabinets. According to the FDA, food fraud is considered economically motivated adulteration, or EMA. It's a monetary impact to the consumer and to the food manufacturers, but it's also a potential public safety, public health impact. It robs us of nutrients and can kill people and has done. Larry Olmsted researched food fraud for years and published his book, Real Food, Fake Food, in 2016. As I worked on this book, my definition of fake food became anytime what you buy is not what you think you're buying. It doesn't really matter whether it's legal or illegal. It's where you're, you're being tricked. You're buying something that's not what you think it is. The worst offenders can include seafood, meat, dairy, honey, alcohol, spices. The fraud happens more with more expensive foods. Totally makes sense, right? There's a higher margin. Take your extra virgin olive oil as an example. Fraud usually occurs here when a cheaper oil is added to the more expensive oil, and the label still reads 100% extra virgin olive oil. That's food fraud. Olive oil has been adulterated for thousands of years because it is of high value and it is sought out. They might flavor it with beta carotene and maybe color it with a little chlorophyll to make it a little more green. And so then you've got a, a, a lower quality, cheaper oil. So both of these olive oils I got at the grocery store and both of them are the store brand, but one cost way more than the other. This one had a label of 100% Mediterranean blend of extra virgin olive oil. So the olives were sourced from a bunch of different European countries and it said it was packed in Italy and there was no expiration date. And when I purchased this one, this one was a 100% California extra virgin olive oil. First pressed, cold pressed, unfiltered, no artificial colors, preservatives or flavors. And this one had an expiration date. It said that these olives were harvested in October, November, 2022, and that it would be good on your shelf until August, 2024. And it was much more expensive. <laughs> it's roughly twice as much as this olive oil. And this one had way more information about where this olive oil came from. Now let's look at the spice market as another one that's vulnerable to fraud. Think of an expensive spice like saffron. This tiny amount cost me $20 at the store. Saffron can be bulked up with some other material like plant stems and sold as the same, according to the FDA. Popular spices like basil and chili powder from a range of different brands. Anything that's kind of colored orange, brown, and ground up 
can be passed off as turmeric. It's the ultimate bait and switch. And then there's fish. The FDA says seafood fraud can occur when a less expensive species of fish is substituted for a more expensive species. After all, it's kind of hard to know what fish you're buying, right? If you're an experienced chef or fishmonger, you can look at like a red snapper filet and tell whether it's red snapper, but 99% of consumers can't. You know, most of the fish we eat is white fish. Every filet looks pretty much the same, which is why there's so much substitution. The FDA is mandated by law to inspect 2% of the imported seafood, which is, I think, a very, very low bar. In fact, the U.S. imports as much as 85% of its fish. But federal fisheries enforcement is serious business. Agents from NOAA and U.S. Customs tear open a container filled with frozen fish from Thailand. They're looking for fraud. First, it's important to understand the matrix that food fraud lives in. There's intentional and unintentional types of food risk. Unintentional risks include food safety and quality, like accidental foodborne illnesses. CDC estimates about 50 million people a year contract a foodborne illness. Only 20%, one in five of those can be identified. So there's you know, 40 million people a year getting sick from something they ate that we don't know what it is. And a good guess would be that fraud has something to do with that. Then there's intentional. That's where food fraud is alongside food defense. The difference is fraud is motivated by economic gain and defense is motivated by harm. If you have a ton of coffee and you can turn that into 1.2 tons by adding some cheap filler to it, you've just increased your profits by 20%. And a lot of these products pass through a lot of hands. They go from small growers to big trucks, to tankers, to boats, to processing plants. It's not necessarily like this big company that's selling you coffee that's ripping you off. It can happen in a lot of ways along the way. Even the FDA says it can't estimate how often this fraud happens or its economic impact. Over the last 10 years, the most common fraud committed is lying about an animal's origin and dilution or substitution, both ranking at 16% of incidents recorded. Dilution and substitution are exactly what they sound like. Perhaps somewhere along the supply chain, the real expensive process of refining something like fresh olives is ignored. Maybe a little canola oil is added instead. Then there's the removal of value, when an ingredient or part of a food is intentionally left out taken out or substituted altogether. And that substitute can be a non-food substance. That's the 14% of the recorded food fraud incidents using non-food substances. The pandemic has given us a chance to focus on supply chains and, and forced us to. For example, during the pandemic, labeling fraud really spiked in 2021 to 21% of the types of fraud that were committed and recorded. You know, if we knew all about it, why hasn't it been solved? The key was we weren't focusing on prevention. Food fraud prevention, if we do it right, is boring. We're the fire marshal checking exits and uh, smoke alarms, not, not catching the bad guys. The U.S. has laws in place to ensure food safety. That's part of what the FDA does today. Basically, all food fraud, all product fraud is illegal under one law or another, somehow. Before the FDA existed, manufacturers could add basically whatever they wanted into the food. Think of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. That book was published in 1906. That same year, food safety regulation began with the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drugs Act, which outlawed adulterated and misbranded food items. To protect consumers. This ultimately led to the creation of the FDA. The Food and Drug Administration and the... Since then, laws have hit the books to further food safety protocols like the Food Safety Modernization Act signed into law in 2011. And then horse meat hit. The fraud was on a grand scale. Horse meat was blended into beef in the UK, across Europe. And sold to unsuspecting supermarkets for a period of eight months in 2012. The scandal was exposed. And that was a great wake up call. Some companies purposely mislead on labels. Prosecuting the fraudsters committing the crime can be tricky. After all, they're purposely trying to avoid that detection. But criminals are caught, like in 2016. The product labeled Market Pantry 100% Parmesan contained cheaper Swiss and cheddar cheese and an organic filler called cellulose, which can be derived from wood pulp. 
Castle cheese was caught adding wood pulp and cheddar to its grated Parmesan that they sold as 100% Parmesan cheese. The FDA does allow fillers like cellulose in cheese, but it can only make up 4% of the total ingredients. The president of the company got a $5,000 fine, 200 hours of community service, and three years of probation. For its part, the Food and Drug Administration says its job is to make sure food doesn't hurt you, not to police the labels. Fraud is tough for the consumer in terms of food because it's difficult. They don't have a lab in their kitchen. The Food Fraud Prevention Think Tank has a five-question survey consumers can use when shopping for food. One, what type of product is it? Be aware of product that you put on you, in you, or plug in the wall. Two, quality. Can you recognize the difference between the products? If you can't easily tell the difference, that makes you more vulnerable to fraud. If I drink scotch, I couldn't tell you if it's a difference between a $50 bottle and a $5,000 bottle. So I know I could be deceived at that point. Three, supplier. Do you know the retailer or the supplier? And do you trust them? So when you turn that box of cereal or bottle of juice over and read the back, there's a lot of information there that's required by law that's helpful to the consumer. And then question four, are you buying this item online? The supply chain can be shrouded in more mystery when shopping online. So how did you find out about this website? Is it reputable? But it depends on how you find that supplier. And finally, five, complain. Okay, it's not a question, but the food fraud prevention think tank says if the retailer is legit, they will want to know. I think manufacturers can be the victims as well. The FDA also relies on consumers' reports. In recent decades, fraudsters have gotten more sophisticated in the techniques they use to fake the food products. And that means that our detection methods and our test methods and standards have to be better at detecting fraud. That's why the U.S. Pharmacopoeial Convention provides a framework for organizations to detect its vulnerabilities. We have food fraud mitigation guidance, so it is a supply chain risk management tool to really take a look at which ones are the more risky products suspected to be adulterated. Sometimes it feels like this is not that big of a deal, but the more fraudsters are able to achieve, the more we end up paying in the end as consumers. These cases rarely result in criminal penalties. If you want to be like a drug dealer and import heroin and you get arrested on you know, a large scale, you're going to go to jail. But if you can make $80 million importing adulterated honey and then you're going to get a slap on the wrist and some fines, why wouldn't you do food instead of drugs if there's no basically criminal downside to it? So as long as we don't take it seriously, why should the perpetrators take it seriously? What we want is the food industry just to be focused on making food and not have to worry about looking over our shoulder, checking different suppliers. And that's going to impact more food being produced, better food, safer food, less expensive food. There's plenty of things for us to worry about in the world today. And food fraud should not be one of those. For Calmaine Foods, the nation's largest egg producer, 2022 was a bit of an extravaganza. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, the egg came first in this story. Calmaine Foods, the egg company, shares are soaring this year up 64%. While you paid $4.30 on average in December 2022 for a dozen eggs, compared to $1.80 in 2021, Calmaine reported a nearly 32% increase in revenue in 2022 from 2021. I think it's a testament to the fact that they haven't had any outbreaks, how good they've been at biosecurity in their facilities. This is a very experienced, very deep management team that's been in this industry for a long time. Eggs are an about $10 billion industry, with nearly 13% growth annually in profit from 2017 to 2022. But it's also a volatile one that's sensitive to market changes or environmental factors. And of course, it's not one without controversy. Each bird is given less space than the dimensions of an iPad on which to live her entire life. And so they have to eat, sleep, defecate, all in the same area, and they're denied virtually everything that's natural to them. Everyone tries to make money, but it's a low margin. It's a very low margin industry. There are 373 million laying hens around the United States as of January 2023. 
After hens lay eggs at a farm, they get graded by the United States Department of Agriculture and put into cartons, sold to retailers, and then purchased by you, the consumer. The egg industry has been a relatively low margin, low return business, given that the producers are responsible for growing the hens, keeping them fed. They're exposed to things like corn and soybean costs. And so that's created a pretty volatile margin structure and had relatively low margins over time. More than 9 billion eggs were produced in the United States in December 2022. More than half of the eggs produced are typically table eggs, white eggs produced by battery chickens. About 8% are brown, 19% produced by cage-free chickens, about 6% by organic-free range, and nearly 14% are hatching eggs. Calmain Foods, the only public egg producer, holds nearly 17% of market share. Like some of the other larger companies, it operates farms, processing plants, hatcheries, feed mills, warehouses, offices, and other properties around the country. The second largest producer is Roseacre Farms with about 7%. Then there's Versova Holdings and Hillendale Farms with just more than 5% each, and Michael Foods with 3.5%. Eggs are a vertically integrated business. So the egg producers control from the time the chick is hatched through the end of when it can no longer lay eggs, right? They control that whole process. Once an egg is, is laid, within two to three days, it's on the shelf at your grocery store. Calmain Foods, headquartered in Ridgeland, Mississippi, was founded in 1957. It has one operating segment, which is the production, grading, packaging, marketing, and distribution of shell eggs. Integrated operations include hatching chicks, growing and maintaining flocks of pullets, layers, and breeders, manufacturing feed, and producing, processing, packaging, and distributing shell eggs. As of May 2022, the company had more than 42 million layers, or hens that lay eggs, and 11 and a half million pullets and breeders. Egg prices are very dynamic. They move up and down every single day. While Calmain is probably the best operator in its space and, and certainly has a great management team, it's been a difficult stock because it's just, it's so volatile and so cyclical. A volatile stock is driven by several factors, company performance being one. In 2022, Calmain revenue was at its highest since 2016. After a steep drop in 2017, among other factors as a result of the avian flu outbreak in 2015, revenue increased in 2018 before beginning a steady decline through the height of the pandemic. Between 2021 and 2022, revenue increased from $1.3 to $1.8 billion, a 40% increase. They're market takers, right? They will take what the market is dictating. This is Angel Rubio a senior analyst at Erner Berry, a market research firm specializing in the wholesale food industry. Prices went up because of what happened with avian influenza. So if your farm wasn't affected by avian influenza, you're probably going to do very well because the market is dictating higher prices overall. Calmain said in its annual report that as of July 2022, no bird flu had been detected at any of its facilities as a result of the latest outbreak. Surging egg prices helped drive Calmain's stock up almost 50% in 2022, even as the S&P 500 fell 19%. There's a massive wave of bird flu that's taking over farms and wildlife centers across the country. Millions and millions of infected birds destroyed so far. 2022 was specifically a, an outlier year. Probably this was the highest price uh, on record at the wholesale level and at the consumer level as well. More than 58 million birds have died since the beginning of 2022 as a result of the deadliest outbreak of avian flu in U.S. history. The flu is lethal and kills 90 to 100 percent of chickens, often within 48 hours. As of January 2023, the number of laying hens in the U.S. is down 5 percent from the same time in 2021. While the U.S. also faced an outbreak in 2015, this time it's different. In 2015, you had the outbreak for a couple of months, but the outbreaks began after Easter. You didn't have corn prices at above $5. You didn't have the war in Ukraine. You didn't have inflationary pressures. The economy was expanding. In 2022, it's still expanding, but there were the prospects of a potential recession. Components are very different in 2022, in addition to the fact that we have multiple outbreaks throughout the year. So there hasn't even been a seasonal recovery overall. The U.S. has lost around 43 million egg-laying hens, about 10 or more percent of the population, due to the disease itself or depopulation since the outbreak began in February 2022. It's very significant. When for every 1% of egg layers lost, prices would move about 6 to 7%, in some cases even 8%, but on average it's about 6%. 
This time, for every 1% layer that we lost, prices went up about 15%. So that's significant when we're talking about supply shocks between 2022 and 2015. New regulations have gone into effect too. In 2016, Massachusetts voted Question 3, also known as an act to prevent cruelty to farm animals, into law, the strongest farm animal protection law in the U.S. at the time. It made it illegal for Massachusetts hens to be confined in such a way that prevents the animal from lying down, standing up, fully extending its limbs, or turning around freely. The majority of hens on industrial egg farms, they're confined to these cages called battery cages. If you look at a sheet of paper, they have less space than that on which to live their entire life. In 2018, California voters approved a similar law to the one in Massachusetts, Proposition 12, the Farm Animal Confinement Initiative. It requires that covered animals, including egg-laying hens, be housed in confinement systems that comply with specific minimum standards for freedom of movement, cage-free design, and minimum floor space. Both Question 3 and Proposition 12 went into effect in January 2022. Those are the only two states that require this, but there are moves by many other states uh, to eventually get to that. The Humane Society of the United States led the campaigns to ban the use of cages in 11 states. In Ohio, not all cages, but battery cages. Eight of those states also banned the sale of eggs from cage facilities. They have to get it from farms that are cage free, which is driving the price off. So it's, it's a disruption overall in the market and that's causing disruption in prices, but not necessarily on availability, but if you look at the prices to the consumer, for instance, for cage-free and conventional eggs, their spread between them is the smallest it has been because they just need those eggs. And those states that mandate those requirements are pulling the cage-free eggs into those markets, which is causing those prices to move up. To give time for producers to modify their operations, these laws are expected to go into effect in the next few years. The industry needs to convert a lot of its existing capacity from caged eggs to cage-free eggs, and that's expensive um, and requires a lot of time and, and effort. In fiscal 2021, CalMain announced its board of directors approved several new capital projects estimated to cost more than $100 million to expand the company's cage-free egg production capabilities. CalMain said it plans to fund these projects through available cash on hand, investments, and operating cash flow. They are converting um, their facilities to, to cage-free because they know there are companies that want to buy them and they know that consumers want them as well. A 2022 poll shows that 80% of all likely voters in the U.S. at least somewhat support Proposition 12. Retailers have committed to only selling cage-free eggs as well, including Walmart, which has said it will do so by 2025. The industry has an estimate that to convert from conventional to cage-free, it's roughly $45 a bird, and that number's even stale relative to kind of what's happened with costs in the past few years, so call it closer to $50 or $55 per bird. So, you know, on a base of 325 million hens, you're converting a big percentage. You know, you're talking from an industry perspective, like billions of dollars. Meanwhile, in California, a state where Proposition 12 went into effect in 2022, the wholesale price increase from 2020 is only eight cents per dozen. High feed prices have also significantly affected margins as layers mostly eat corn. Prices were already high from the end of 2020. Once the war in Ukraine hit, it exacerbated this problem by not letting prices correct downward as we produce corn here in the U.S. Because remember, these egg-laying facilities are in the corn belt because that's where corn is, and it's a massive ingredient for feed. And it's a massive cost of production of the overall industry. Oil prices, energy prices will be impacted by that. You have to be running the barns, and they're energy intensive as well. Microeconomic indicators in the case of, of inflation the same way. To put it simply, the industry is volatile. Prices react to what's happening in the world. The avian flu, inflation, regulation changes, the war in Ukraine, tensions between the US and China, the coronavirus pandemic, supply chain issues, and the cost of feed, labor, fuel, and packaging all impact the price of your egg sandwich and who's making the most money off of your morning treat. In a statement to CNBC, Kalmin Foods said, throughout our history, we've worked to build a business model that can deal effectively with the industry's inherent volatility. We strive to create a culture of sustainability while creating value for customers, shareholders, team members, and communities. In the next few years, the industry is expected to experience 1.2% revenue growth due to steady upticks in egg prices, per capita egg consumption, and demand from chicken egg production. 
Economic or environmental factors could change the outlook, and there is of course the question of how demand will shift based on changes in regulations. To the extent that there are now a bunch of conventional white eggs that are kind of floating around the market, you know, do those flood into other states that aren't, you know, allowing conventional eggs and kind of depress the pricing? I think it's something we don't know yet at this point, but it's it's definitely a risk that we're watching very closely. And with the avian flu wiping out more than 58 million birds, everyone is affected, from the producer all the way to the consumer. I think about my local grocery store. No way what I know about the wholesale market being at that $5.50 plus number that it was in December. They took egg prices up some, but they didn't take it up to that full amount. So the grocers were actually losing money on eggs. They're playing some catch up on that now, but I think on the reverse, they're going to try and restore those margins, at least for a little bit on the way back down. So they won't take the pricing down as as quickly as it went up. It's been an eventful couple of years, but experts aren't worried about the industry's future. We have been in transition, so we don't know what's going to be on the on the other side, but it's it's not terrible, right? It's uh, it's going to be we're going to be just fine. The organic food industry is a booming business. Certified organic products typically have a higher price point and may even be smaller in size or different in taste. But what exactly does organic mean? Regulations vary from country to country, but according to the USDA, organic by itself isn't necessarily a health claim. It just means the food was produced using organic methods. These methods include a list of federal standards addressing things like soil fertility, pest and weed control, and animal raising practices. But most people aren't actually aware of what it takes for a product to receive the USDA organic seal. In 2014, brand consultancy BFG surveyed 300 shoppers. 70% purchased organic food and only 20% could define organic. Despite a lack of knowledge, demand for organic food is at a record high among consumers. And it's only going up. U.S. organic sales surged in 2020, jumping by 12.4% to $61.9 billion. With consumers being more health conscious than ever, they're willing to pay more for what they perceive as better, even if they're not quite sure that it is. In 2018, organic food and beverage items cost an average 24 cents more than conventional food. Some shoppers are doubtful of U.S. organic food claims. Several investigations over the years uncovering organic label fraud have exacerbated consumer suspicion. The USDA's National Organic Program, or NOP, has been stepping up on investigations and enforcement, suspending or revoking 370 operations in the U.S. in 2020 alone. But some say it's not enough. On the fraud issue, they have not been the ones that have been in the forefront. They're supposed to be preventing fraud uh, by the uh, enforcement of the rules. And time and time again, the horse is long out of the barn uh, before the National Organic Program is even aware that there's, there's a problem. Despite efforts to reduce fraud amid rising demand, many consumers still question, are organic foods safer? Are they more nutritious? And are they worth the price? Organic farming was first introduced as a concept called humus farming in the early 20th century in order to address soil erosion and depletion. These practices included composting, rotating crops, and applying animal manure. During World War II, food shortages accelerated agricultural advances by improving mechanization, fertilization, and pesticides. Synthetic fertilizers were affordably produced and machineries were quickly replacing manual labor. The term organic was coined in 1940 by Lord Northburn in his book, Look to the Land, where he talked about taking a natural and ecological approach to farming. He drew inspiration from Sir Albert Howard, whose decades of research led him to the concept that using waste material was vital for soil health. The Industrial Revolution helped the farmer farm more with a better plow and with a tractor and an engine instead of a horse drawn. And then we moved to how do we package and salvage and save this stuff for longer post-World War II. And oh, look at these chemicals. They, they work to, to decimate a jungle. What, would, what could a small amount of that do on a field? You know, that kind of thing. So, and we saw how great these chemicals were. 
But then we realized somewhere along the line, probably in the 60s, I'm assuming, and into the 70s, that, hey, maybe we're doing detriment to ourselves. By the 1970s, environmental concerns increased and consumers began to demand more sustainable produce. In response, Congress passed the Organic Foods Production Act in 1990 to develop a national standard for organic food and fiber production. The final rules were written and implemented in fall 2002. This regulation defines organic agriculture as an ecological production management system that promotes and enhances biodiversity, biological cycles, and soil biological activity. Organic isn't a health claim. It's simply a labeling term that indicates the food has been grown following the federal guidelines of the FPA. According to the USDA, organic farming entails the use of manures, crop rotations, biological control, an emphasis on biodiversity, the use of rotational grazing, a reduction and elimination of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers, and a focus on renewable resources. As for livestock and poultry, the standards require that animals have access to the outdoors year-round, fed 100% organic feed, and not administered antibiotics or hormones. Consumers looking to shop organic may look for the USDA seal of approval. So let's talk about the different kind of labeling categories. Uh, you can have a 100% uh, organic uh, product. So for example, that organic uh, apple that you take off the shelf and eat, that's 100% organic. You can also have products that are 95% or more organic composition. And, and a product needs to have more than 95% in order to carry that USDA uh, seal. And so you might be talking about, for example, a, a granola bar that has um, different kinds of ingredients in it. If more than 95% of those ingredients are organic, it can use the organic seal. There's also a made with organic uh, category. So for example, macaroni and cheese. Um, it may be that uh, the cheese or the, the macaroni or some other component of a product is organic, but the rest of the product is not. Multi-ingredient products with less than 70% certified organic content cannot use the organic seal or use the word organic on the front of the food package. However, they can list certified organic ingredients in the ingredient list and the percentage of organic ingredients. Consumer demand for organic products is rising quickly, showing double-digit growth over the past decade in the U.S. As of February 2021, organic products in the U.S. can be found in nearly 20,000 natural food stores and nearly 75% of conventional grocery stores. And organic sales account for 4% of total U.S. food sales. The booming organic market in the U.S. can be attributed to a few things, namely the declining price gap between organic and conventional products. In 2018, organic food and beverage items cost an average of 24 cents more than conventional food. That was down from 27 cents in 2014, a nearly 2% drop. Organic produce seems to be getting cheaper for a number of reasons. For one, a rising dependency on fossil resources is causing the price of conventional foods to increase, while government subsidies keep the prices artificially low and more private label retailers are getting in on organic foods, creating a downward pressure in the industry to reduce prices. There are tons of reasons why organic food is more expensive in the first place, but it all boils down to the fact that it costs more to produce. It takes more money and labor to adhere to the USDA's strict standards regarding production, handling, labeling, and storing. Not to mention, demand beats out supply. Farmers are just uh, not that interested in the organic standard. They don't. They see higher land costs, higher labor costs, and so not too many uh, make the make the switch. And that restricts the supply of organic, and that's why the price is so high. Over the past decade, shoppers have become increasingly more mindful of their health, and COVID-19 has accelerated those trends. According to a 2020 survey. 54% of all consumers cared more about the healthfulness of their food and beverage choices in 2020 than they did in 2010. Some health-conscious consumers gravitate toward organic over conventional products due to concerns about highly processed foods, artificial ingredients, and the effects of pesticides, hormones, and antibiotics. 
According to a study by Pew Research, 76% of adults surveyed bought organic foods for their health value, followed by environmental concerns at 33% and convenience at 22 But there is conflicting data about whether or not organic foods are healthier or safer. Take, for instance, pesticide residue. The consumption of pesticide-contaminated food is a major source of human pesticide exposure. And according to a 2017 review in environmental health, our current levels of exposure to pesticides can lead to adverse effects on children's cognitive development. In adults, exposure to pesticides may also lead to the development of Parkinson's disease, fertility issues, and cognitive decline. It also mentioned that antibiotics used in conventional animal production is a key driver of antibiotic resistance in society. The average conventional apple in the United States today contains about four different pesticide residues. And science science is, is not at the stage where we can say with certainty what uh, daily exposures to four or five pesticides from food is doing to our children. But there is a broad consensus that it's probably not doing anything helpful. However, there is some data that says otherwise. Organic does not mean that the produce is grown without any pesticides. A few naturally occurring pesticides are approved by the USDA. Research in 2005 at the University of California suggests that the negative public perception of pesticides is overblown and that the pesticide residue in both organic and conventional crops are too low to have any adverse effects on health. Maybe uh, conventional food has a very low exposure for a pesticide residue and it's not a problem, but maybe organic food has an exposure level that's even lower. So it's not a problem either. I conclude that both are safe and you should be making your, your food choice on, on the basis of, of something uh, more substantial. While there's a lot of discrepancy about whether organic is safer and healthier long-term, many agree that organic food isn't better in terms of nutritional value. The Environmental Health Review concluded that there was no significant difference in nutrition between organic and conventional crops. An orange that's grown conventionally and an orange that's grown organically, I think they're going to have the same vitamins in them. I really do. I, I've been an orange grower all my life, and uh, we haven't changed much from when, when Dad did it. Organic food is not healthier or safer for you. Whether it's organically grown or conventionally grown, it's going to have the same nutrient content. Now, there are situations where you may find an organic orange, say, may have 10 milligrams of, say, vitamin C in it, theoretically. It means absolutely nothing to you as far as your health goes because of the conventional orange, orange, let's say, has 95 milligrams of vitamin C in it. And let's say an organically grown orange may have 110 milligrams, 105 milligrams of vitamin C in it. Well, your body doesn't need either one of them. It only needs about 35 milligrams of them. You don't need anyway. It's like driving down the road and you have a full tank of gas and you see a gas station and you say, oh, I'm going to pull in more gas. Well, there's no point because your gas tank's full. Some studies conclude that there simply isn't enough strong evidence. Many people uh, ask me, is organic food more nutritious than uh, uh, conventional food? Obviously, that's a complex question, and it varies between, say, animal products like meat, milk, and eggs, and fruits and vegetables or, or grains. But in general, for all plant-based foods, organic food has between 20 and 25 percent higher levels of what's called antioxidants. Now, on the animal side of agriculture, which is you know roughly half the calories that the typical American consumes in a day, the biggest differences with organic farming are in the fatty acid profile in meat and eggs and milk and dairy products. And these differences are significant. At the height of the pandemic, organic grains like rice and pasta were flying off the shelves, mainly due to their long shelf life. Harvesting and selling organic grains is a big business. It demands a higher price because it costs more to produce. To earn the National Organic Seal, the plants cannot have been genetically modified, and they must be grown without the help of unauthorized fertilizers, weed killers, or pesticides. But who's verifying this? 
There are about 75 third-party agencies certified by the USDA to inspect over 16,000 organic farms in the U.S. These private inspectors perform annual audits that include questioning, reviewing documents, and examining records, but rarely does it mean actually testing the soil or produce. Certifying agents are only required to test 5% of their total operations per year. This process largely relies on the honor system and an ethical seller can pass off cheaper conventional grown grain for the more expensive organic kind and make a huge profit. And some are doing just that. In 2017, a Washington Post investigation revealed that non-organic soy and corn labeled as organic was flooding the U.S. About 36 million pounds of conventional soybeans imported from Ukraine and Turkey were originally priced like regular soybeans, but by the time they reached California, they had been labeled as organic boosting their value by $4 million. 61-year-old Randy Constance was sentenced to 10 years in prison in 2019 for the largest organic fraud case in U.S. history. However, there is a broad consensus that imported produce is more likely to be fraudulent than domestic-grown crops. The organic fraud in grain started because of the high demand for especially eggs and, and meat and the fact that domestic production could not keep up with the demand. They started looking overseas and the first place that they went uh, that had open holes was the, uh, Ukraine. And the Black Sea region has continually been a uh, problematic area because of Black's oversight. The rapid growth of the organic food market, higher potential for fraud, and increased funding has allowed the NLP to significantly increase its enforcement staff over the past year. In February 2020, the NLP launched an online complaint portal to make it easier for consumers to file complaints. There were 676 operations in 45 countries in 2020 that were suspended or revoked which is lower than the 722 suspended or revoked operations in 2019. John Bob, former executive director of O-Farm, says they could be doing more. If the USDA or NOP comes across a fraudulent shipment, they have no authority to stop it. They were given a clean slate with money to draft uh, new rules with stronger enforcement. They were given the authority. So what did they do? They spent the money on uh, the, the low fruit, the easy stuff, upgrading their organic integrity database. We have caught bad guys, both domestically in the United States and overseas. So as an example, recently we worked closely with Customs and Border Protection, which is the federal agency that protects imports, uh, to block uh, incoming shipment of, um, of cooking oil, of oil, uh, that was shipped by a suspended operation. And so that's an example of how we have blocked uh, fraud coming into the United States. Uh, and there have been some uh, very public stories of um, organic fraud where people in the United States have paid fines or gone to jail uh, by defrauding the American public. Again, our job is to make sure an organic is a choice that can be trusted by consumers across the country. Despite a lack of significant data, experts say the organic food industry is here to stay. The overall consensus from farmers and experts is to put less focus on the USDA organic seal and instead eat more fruits and veggies from your local farmer. The problem isn't the food in the marketplace, it's the fact that uh, not enough Americans purchase uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. As I've said, we only consume one-tenth the fresh fruits and vegetables that we should be consuming for, for dietary health. Do I think everybody should purchase organic over conventional? I think everybody should eat fruit and vegetables from their backyard, meaning the farm that's closest to you. Support your local farmers. Eat as much as you can locally, and then enjoy what you want globally.